Hi, everybody. Welcome to our panel today. So today we're going to speak about XR in logistics. And uh, I'm very honored to be your host on today's session. I'm Percy Stocker. I'm EVP AR Americas at TeamViewer. And so I've been in the industry for 10 years. So it was amazing to see it grow from an emerging technology and really becoming one of the standard tools that many companies use today. So today we're going to talk about how AR and VR have reshaped supply chains of major companies in the past decade. And uh, it's, it's my great honor to introduce our panel that we have today. Uh, so first of all, let me welcome uh, Dawn Miller. Uh, she's manager as and head of Microsoft Burton, and she is focusing on the analysis of business solutions. And so she's gonna talk about how VR has really reshaped training in logistics, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to hear her stories about that. Uh, then next we have uh, Alberto Ultra, and he has been with DHL for quite a long time and uh, in various roles, but most recently, actually not so recently, for nine years, I believe it is now, he has been the uh, CEO for the Spanish-speaking countries in South America. And so it's, it's great to hear his perspectives, especially as CEO, he needs to have the broader picture about things. And then emerging technology is always great, but it needs to fit a business purpose. So we're looking forward to hear these overarching thoughts as well. Um, next, we have Matthew Hoffman, and he's a senior manager at, at XPO Logistics, and uh, where he's managing IT projects and programs to really drive growth and innovation by using these emerging technologies. And he is also uh, the founder of Dizzy Magnolia, a VR uh, development studio. And uh, he is very passionate about providing guidance uh, to companies and individuals who really want to utilize VR and, and, and being a mentor to anybody who's um, out in this space and wants to make progress there. And then last but not least, we have uh, Scott Berkey from Westrock uh, on, the, on the panel today. And uh, he, he is a diehard developer that has built some of the largest websites uh, over the last uh, 25 years. And to give you an example at his former employer, uh, the NBA, he uh, really made it happen to make uh, basketball games available on virtual reality for fans. And how cool is that? I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing. And so at, at Westrock, he's uh, really heading up the extended reality products offering uh, in, in all the different aspects. So we have a super interesting panel, very diverse experiences um, on the line today. And before we dive into the various topics, and we're gonna to talk about training, we're gonna talk about collaboration, we're gonna talk about AR guided workflows and also how to avoid some of the pitfalls and the challenges that uh, you can avoid uh, by using tapping into the experience of our panelists. I would like to invite everybody to give a short overview of the activities that you have been mainly engaged in so that everybody has a little bit of context uh, to, to what you're doing as we dive into the individual questions. And uh, to start, I would to like to invite uh, Don to, to make the start and talk a little bit about what you have been up to on the AR VR space. Yeah, so thank you, Percy. Um, so, so being at Amerisource Bergen, um, we have taken a, an interest and a focus on virtual reality and leveraging that for training for our associates, uh, but specifically our distribution or warehouse center associates. Um, we've created a virtual reality solution with the goal in mind to kind of familiarize our associates with what that healthcare journey um, the, of the supply chain looks like. Uh, so we have uh, deployed a solution uh, about three months ago now that gives the associate the ability to kind of be engaged and interactive um, in an environment where they get that hands-on experience, uh, where they can view the, the journey of a medication making its way from the manufacturer all the way back to the patient's hands uh, successfully. Perfect. Thanks a lot for the, for the overview. Um, Alberto, do you want to go next? Thanks, Percy. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. Well, logistics has been, a, I would say, a, I would conservative uh, sector, but in the last year with, uh, with all this uh, e-commerce, 
I would say that we've been focused a lot in digitalization and we've been also focused in training as, as Don was mentioning. And VR has been a key piece for us. What we are doing is because we have operations all over the ports and airports of the countries, instead of going there, what we developed was a training. And then uh, the new employees can, can do this training and can also play a little bit with the operational uh, site of the ports and airports with the cargo uh, without moving from the office. No? And that has increased a lot our productivity, less errors. I mean, and, and also in my opinion, this attracts a lot of talent. No, I mean, young people want to, to have this type of, of new tools, uh, especially in the technology side. And for us, it's been great that we've been able to attract this talent for, for the company. Perfect. Yeah, everybody wants the latest toys. That's that's for sure. And and I'm I'm personally very proud of the. With, I'm I'm German, so having seen such an emerge uh, an innovative player emerge out of the German post is just great to see. So that's 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 pretty cool. Uh, Max, do you want to go next and uh, and tell us a little bit about your activities? Certainly. Thank you, Percy. And uh, great to be here with uh, this excellent panel. So excited to hear what other people are, are also going to talk about during this time. So I work with um, large scale projects and programs that are really looking to make a big impact in, in change in the enterprise. Uh, because I also have a, a passionate interest in virtual reality content creation, I, I do uh, have an opportunity to work with some of the advanced technology teams to help to foster the adoption of uh, virtual reality. Uh, also explore some of those aspects of VR that um, really are, are the, the paradigms that VR provides, like embodiment, um, embodied cognition, uh, spatial embedding, uh, uh, um, um, just spatial awareness of, of your surroundings. And, and just as Alberto had mentioned, putting individuals in situations that maybe would be too dangerous otherwise, or um, that really are hard to get folks to on a physical level. So um, really, I've been mainly uh, providing some mentorship and guidance with regards to storytelling, um, how to grow VR in the enterprise. One of the the challenges is how do you take an innovation from idea to impact? How do you operationalize that idea? So that's other aspects of the work that I've been doing so far within virtual reality uh, in the enterprise is just helping it to grow from that proof of concept or that pilot program into a larger scale integrated solution for the organization. Perfect. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's on the mind of, of many people is how do we actually make it happen? Uh, one, one of the individuals that makes it happen is Scott. Do you want to tell about your experiences a little bit? Percy, thanks for having me. I'm a, I'm a big fan of EWTS. Uh, what a great event every year. And Brand Exchange is certainly a wonderful organization to be, uh, to be a part of. And, and uh, I look forward to this panel as well. You know, so Westrock, we manufacture. Um, product packaging uh, for a lot of the items you see on the grocery store shelf or at big box retailers. We also make retail displays um, and uh, that those packages go on, those products go on. Uh, and so we have about 300 factories globally, mills and factories. We, we, we turn uh, old paper into new paper. We turn trees into paper um, and we, uh, we make packaging. And so um, with 300 mills and factories, we do a lot of um, enabling factory workers to be able to, to do their jobs uh, more efficiently and in a safer manner. Uh, so a lot of factory support, training and support of our factory workers is huge. We have uh, you know, over 40,000 uh, people in factories globally. And so I spend a lot of time out in factories working with people, putting devices in their hands and on their heads and helping them um, troubleshoot, diagnose, fix, repair machinery, um, and to do so in a, in a safe way. We do some other things as well that, that are pretty neat with XR with regards to how we interact with our customers um, and how we um, uh, connect with our OEM providers and, and partners. Uh, but a big focus, of course, is on 
how we keep those factories, the machines in those factories up and running and uh, producing the products that are essential for, for all of us. Perfect. So th thanks a lot for everybody for kind of setting the scene a little bit about the, the background and the experiences that you have had. And we, we can see that there's a lot of valuable cases. One of the recurring themes that is always coming up is that training aspect and how do you onboard new people and train them and so on. And, and one of the aspects that I would like to hone in a little bit deeper is the, the storytelling. And I think the keyword already came up from Matt uh, earlier, uh, but I know that that's uh, top of your mind as, as well, Don. So could you speak a little bit about your storytelling and what kind of role it actually plays in the experience? Yeah, so I, I would say that part of that, the, the pre-production, aside from the post-production strategy um, is key to saving um, cost and funds and really meeting that goal that you're looking to deliver. Um, as part of training you know, in, and delivering the solution, one of the key factors is knowing exactly the story that you're looking to tell. Um, at Amerisource Bergen, we're uh, true advocates for user acceptance testing, user interviews, um, usability. Um, and so we want to get kind of in the position of those users to understand what it is that they need to kind of get out of the solution. Uh, so in distribution centers, there are various roles involved in the process. So picking and packing and shipping. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that the training included a level of gamification to be able to test that associate skills um, and knowledge on how successful they are in understanding the training that we're delivering. Um, so kind of going through that interactive experience prior to starting the development phase is, is key for us when it comes to training. Perfect. No, that's, that, that's, that's great to hear. And, and as, you, as you kind of brought it up, Matt, already on, on your introduction, is, is, is there some aspects that you would like to add to that storytelling element? I, I really like what Don had mentioned about the gamification. Uh, part of what that provides to a user of these new technologies is, is purpose and meaning behind their actions. And I would say that from a storytelling perspective, when you are thinking about creating an experience that is within virtual reality, it really is an isolated experience. The participants are within a, a almost a, a personal world, if you will. And one of the things that you can get from virtual reality is um, a, a heightened sense of, um, well, better uh, memorization or, or memory uh, of an experience or recall of an experience. And it's important to be aware of the fact that you're, you're creating this kind of body cognition experience where someone's not only just seeing and thinking, but they might be also doing and acting. So you wanna put them in a context that um, is meaningful. And so it's meaningful will in essence mean that an experience provides somebody with a heightened uh, sense of remembering. The gamification can as well. So I, I think that all of these kind of contribute to this concept of purpose. And uh, I, I really admire VR because it gives us as creators yet another dimension of putting somebody into a situation and um, letting an idea or a concept lay hold even further. So. Uh, that that storytelling and all of these other components that kind of surround that storytelling really uh, are important, I think, uh, in development, even if you're thinking about developing for the enterprise, uh, because after all, we're, we're training humans uh, and putting it into with a, a human context really matters. Oh, I fully I agree. agree, Matt. Okay, Ed. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was just going to add to that, you know, that it's the planning that goes into it, um, really understanding what that story is end to end um, is key. So I, I have shared uh, with this group earlier that um, probably we spent the most time in doing just that, understanding what the story is, especially when we're moving through a journey and a life cycle, we needed to make sure that we captured the experience for each one of those specifically. So whether it's the manufacturer, the distribution center, uh, back to the patient, you know, if they're at home or if they're in a hospital care, um, really understanding what is happening in that experience, what's happening in that environment, so that when we get to the next step or the next stage in that life cycle, it makes sense and it connects. 
Um, and so I, I always highly recommend take that initial time up front. It may take uh, more than expected, but make sure you're going through and really defining what that script's going to be so it makes sense to the user, especially when they're being tasked to you know, perform that gamification and, and be tested on their skills. No, absolutely. And anybody who has seen a, a, a bad action movie with great effects, but no story can relate to yeah. that. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's exactly the experience that we don't want to create. So better yeah. think about what you want to talk about and how to create that emotional uh, connection with the audience. Perfect. Right. No plot <laughs> twists. <laughs> no plot <laughs> twists. <laughs> surprise, surprise them a little bit. Um, so once you have the story, um, kind of built and, 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 and which is probably the most difficult part. How do you go about content creation? Is, 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 that, is there something, some advice that you can share uh, with the audience about that, Matt? Sure, so, so it's very important to think uh, in terms of, well, traditional development where you, you don't wanna create the final product, especially in virtual reality, but you want to test out even your hypothesis on how is this experience going to actually be felt? Uh, talking about the, the pre-production and the script writing, absolutely vital, but you do need to test that because again, you're, you're kind of translating this not, not just from a screenplay or, or a storyboard into a two-dimensional environment, but you're actually putting people into this spatial environment where there are aspects that might pop out of the woodwork that you weren't expecting. So uh, there's a term called gray boxing, very, uh, very important to put together just maybe some basic um, scenes that take the, the plan into consideration, work it out, get some folks in there, especially non-VR developer testers, folks that actually are going to be the end users because it's still a relatively new, um, new platform. And I think we as developers must take into account that um, it's an abstraction at this point that can actually be hard to understand unless it's well designed. So very simple um, developing uh, of, of that platform in iterations with good feedback, I think is a, a critical aspect to that development cycle, especially at the beginning. Mm -hmm. No, that makes a lot of sense. Is there some aspects that you want to add to that, Don? As you're you're also kind of taking it from the story and then then into the creation part. Yeah, I think part of that initial phase when you're thinking through your strategy is to to determine you know what it is what is it that you're looking to communicate. Are you looking to um, show the empathy that's needed um, in that particular situation, or are you looking more kind of instructional? This is what you need to do. Um, without the emotion behind it. So I, I think kind of taking a look at, you know, how do you want to deliver this? Do you want to, you know, display 360 videos um, uh, or photos? Or do you want to have more of a virtual kind of reality cartoonish, if you will, um, type of illustration? Um, and once you determine that, um, then you want to take, you know, kind of the components that are necessary to give it that most realistic feel that you can. Um, mm -hmm. So I know we spent some time getting actual pictures, um, our branding in place. Uh, so we had to take a look at what does it really look like in the, the shipping area or the packing area. Um, so when we built the solution out, we had those images to reference and create the most realistic uh, view that we could. Perfect. No, that makes a lot of sense. And um, I mean, one of the, the, the things that comes to mind now that we talked a little bit about how to define the story and, and how to create it is, is tools. I mean, uh, there's, uh, there's certain tools needed to do that. Um, and I know that we talked about that in the past a little bit, Matt. Do you have some thoughts that you can share with the audience on the make or buy decision? Do we kind of try it ourselves, or, or how do we go about it? Right. So it, it VR is a an interesting platform because it's just I would say recently become commercialized where you now have uh, we've gone from the Quest and the Vive to uh, I'm I'm sorry the eight, the the Rift and the Vive which are tethered PC dependent now we have portable headsets with the Quest One Quest Two the it, well the Oculus Go so there's there's a quite a bit of proliferation of different headsets out there now. But as that 
proliferation of diverse headsets have been available, so have the approaches for development. And they've been quite confusing to some extent with a lot of different teams because there's just so many different tools and, and maybe l lack of standardizations until recently we've started to see some of those standardizations like with OpenXR uh, and other, other platforms and APIs that allow it to be much more um, pleasing for a developer to work on less iterations and less permutations of an app. But I would say it's a real interesting question for an organization to pose, do we create it ourselves or do we look to third parties who maybe have been there, done that before? It, I, I think it's an important thing to explore. If an organization has the skill sets or has advanced technology teams that are um, willing to explore that uh, VR or AR, I think it's really important for them because they have domain experience. They have the expertise in their, their particular field. But there are also third parties who also have some of that experience as well. So. I think it's something to explore. Um, I'm actually really interested in Alberto and, and Scott, if if you also can contribute to what your experience has been. Um, thanks, uh, Matt. Uh, in, the, in the case of DHL, I mean, we have three innovation centers in the world where we develop some of the technology. Basically, we explore the new technology for packaging, uh, new picking or uh, I, uh, internet of things that actually it's really relevant now for this new e-commerce boom. But in the case of the VR, uh, in the case of Chile that I'm based in Santiago, we decided to partnership with a startup. That I think was a great, great uh, process because uh, I'm not into technology that much. No, I'm, I'm managing more, like I said, uh, maybe traditional sector, no, no, no longer that traditional, but it's not a tech company. Uh, and the fact that we developed that together, I, I could see their point of view. We could tell what we wanted and we partnership for like six, eight months, developing the storytelling, the graphs, the measurement that for me was important as well, because uh, we need, for me, one of the best thing is we were able to test it, to measure it, to see the improvement of the new colleagues that they were uh, onboarding in, into the HL and um, without any risk, they could make all the mistakes they wanted and there was no issue. No? The fact that we were able to do that with an external company and being partners and then every time we need uh, support with VR to create another type of training, uh, we, we try to partner them. And, and I think it's a good experience for us to, to do it in-house, it would have been, a, I think, a, a curving, a, a learning curve too long and maybe not successful. I think we need to focus our efforts in our core business, that is uh, international transportation in this case, or warehousing or logistics, and not developing uh, VR because it's, I think it's too far away from our knowledge. Yeah, it can, can be tough. And there's a lot of standard tools on the market now that, that can be utilized and expert in the field. Scott, do you want, want to add to that uh, as well? Yeah, same thing. I mean, there, there are a lot of great platforms out there to be able to help get you, you know, jump started to, to building content. And listen, you know, one thing I know is that I don't know nearly as much as I tend to think I do. And so I'm always open to you know, new partners, new tools seeing what's happening out there. We run across stuff. I run across stuff constantly, um, new platforms and advancements in platforms. And, and uh, I'll, never, I'll never turn down a, a good idea, you know, or a, a, a something that's working for somebody else, see if it might work for us. So uh, we use a lot of uh, vendors and tools and platforms. Uh, we're a small team. There's only four of us uh, on the team at West Rock. And in the last two years, we have uh, accelerated very rapidly, and so we'll we'll take a good idea or a, a, a partnership anywhere we can we can find that it makes sense. You bet. Perfect, perfect. Maybe let's let's talk a little bit about the the benefits then also. I mean, now we talked a little bit about the journey and how we do that. Um, um, Alberto, kind of from a business perspective, that's that's your main main focus. Uh, certainly, like the overarching principles, is what kind of benefits do you see from from the VR? 
Well, first of all, I mean, in terms of digitalization, I think it's not if we are going to go through that path, if when, no? And as soon as possible, I think is the best answer. No? Because uh, we cannot get behind, especially because all the wearables, uh, even though they're in a personal uh, life that we have smartphones, iWatch or smartwatches, I think we need to implement that in, in our professional lives as well. Then VR, in that case, I mean, especially today, you know, with unfortunately the pandemic situation and all the restrictions we have, we can do all the trainings we want, we can do all the tests without exposing people to other people. That's for us, the safety and the health of our employees is really important. Then VR that we didn't think when we developed the program, of course, three years ago, because we didn't know at all. But now we see another uh, positive impact of the VR. Second, as I mentioned, I think uh, young people want to work in, a, in an environment that they understand that they have these new toys, they can develop themselves. And for us to attract this new talent and to keep it and retain it is, is really important. VR has, has given us that. Third is productivity, you know, the fact that the people do not need to travel to the places to see the real operation. Uh, it's something that also saves us a lot of time and, and at the end, of course, a lot of money. And I think also the flexibility. You know? If we include a new product or if we include a new service in our portfolio, we can always develop another training and um, update the, our employees in the, new, in the new service without putting a lot of effort in, in, in coordination or logistics, just uh, doing and developing, of course, the software and then testing it. And of course, everybody can be updated more or less at the same time because there is a devices, a number of devices that we have. But I think it's, uh, I would say, endless possibilities in terms of developing whatever we want. And then in that respect, is, is it fits a lot our strategy of digitalization I think it's also um, very, very flexible for us to include all these and being, uh, we expanded very easily through the region. We started in Chile and we, we implemented in all the countries because at the end of the day, it's just uh, the, the wearables and the, and the software can be, you know, sent very easily. And this is, was uh, for us a very scalable technology then yeah. the investment is here, but we can escalate it to all the countries that, I, that they are under my umbrella and the trainings are, and the operations are really similar and very standardized and there's no big issues for us to customize the software a little bit in, in other type of, in, in other countries. Then in a business aspect, I think has a lot of uh, positive impact, uh, the VR uh, tool or technology. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, it's and, and the scalability is certainly something that is uh, is super achievable. If you have wearable technology, it kind of walks around with you, and that's not installed in the environment. That that's Correct. that's always a benefit. Um, and now, now with the sorry. sorry with the home office, um, with the home office that not everybody's together now in the offices. I think it's even even a, a, a higher need for mm -hmm. the for the. Um, and for the company to be able to distribute that and people can do that training uh, at, the, at their house, houses and uh, or home and, and there is no issue about it. Perfect. Um, Don, do you want to share a little bit also about the, the positive effects and benefits that you have seen from, from your deployment? Yeah, so I'd say that, you know, having that contact spread out across all of Amerisource of our and Associates, you know, despite it's kind of geared towards the distribution center experience, um, it just makes our associates more productive when they understand um, actually putting themselves in the patient's uh, place and understanding that that patient needs the medication. So kind of further into that story, um, the medication does get damaged along the way. And I said, I know we said no plot twist, um, but the medication does get damaged along the way, but that's their 
their kind of test and their assessment is, you know, we want you to see the impact that it has on the patient. And so I think that's one of the kind of positive and, and productive results we got from that is, you know, we come to work every day and we, we tend to be so productive um, in our roles, but we want to take a kind of step back and see what the patient's experience really is. Um, in this story, you know, the, the patient is a child. And so it gives that kind of a kind of emotional impact to understand that, you know, what we're dealing with every day and what we're working on has a super big impact on the lives of our patients. And our goal is to create healthier futures. So, so it's really emotionally anchored uh, for, for the warehouse associate and rather than kind of a please do that, but it, it puts that emotional anchor with that concrete person in, in place. I love that. Right. So they're, they're coming to work for a purpose. I mean, we, we know that, um, but being able to see it um, and see the end result, you know, at, at the end of that, when the patient does, the child does get the medication, you know, on, on time and intact um, is the goal that we wanted to portray. Perfect. Yeah. And the question is now really is if, if you, if these are the benefits, how, how do you, is, is there a way to measure maybe the results of the training even better by using the, the devices and, and the, the sensors and metrics that they offer? Um, is that something that you can comment on, Matt? Yeah, I think when, when we think about the applications that you create in virtual reality, they really can be looked upon as part of an ecosystem within your organization. And that ecosystem might include learning and development uh, platforms. I know uh, within our organization, there are certain certifications that an associate would need to go through in order to be able to perform a certain uh, activity or task. So from a design perspective, when you're thinking about creating a virtual reality experience, you can um, think about metrics that are tied to these certifications and then also working very closely with L&D to develop the platforms so that you are capturing the right metrics. I think those are some areas of opportunity uh, within larger organizations uh, that you can take, especially if you're developing these AR, VR applications and just make them part of the whole ecosystem of training. Hmm. Yeah, they need, need to be integrated in the overall picture. And I know, Scott, that you have been also looking into that, right? Yeah, I spent a lot of time Percy looking at um, just basic metrics of, you know, from the solutions that we have in factories or the, the devices that we've, we've put out with customers that are looking at our products in VR. I spent a lot of time looking at, you know, who's logging on, how long are they in the experiences? Um, you know, how long is it taking someone to do something? And it's, it's good to kind of see uh, from these metrics what your adoption is or isn't. Um, but I, you know, probably like, like my colleagues here on the call, I like to really look, I tell you what I get excited about is when you look at, you know, how has this affected the production rate in our factories? How has this improved safety in our factories? Um, what's, what's the impact been on our employee retention? Are we a cooler place to work than the factory down the, down the road in a certain market, right? Um, are people staying longer? Um, uh, are we certainly are we lowering travel costs and travel time? Uh, but you know, are we are we winning business uh, because of this? I mean, the first piece of business that we won that that uh, that XR played a, a a vital part of was like game changing, man. It's like you know, we built a little VR app and we just helped win some business for our company. So we had a, a good little celebration on the team, and and I think you know, if we're if we're training people faster and training them to do their jobs better. And they get to do that training in a video game, right? Uh, in a headset. I mean, they love it. And it's uh, it's not always super easy to track and kind of quantify, but it's um, you see the smiles and you, you get to you get to see how it's it's uh, a cool thing. Uh, and it's it's tough to put dollar signs to this is cool when they say that, but you know that it's helping the company, it's because it's helping the people, and so it's uh a lot of metrics there, some of which you can track, some of them you can't. But um, this is what a what a great time to be in this industry. You bet. And it's always to make an innovation successful. I mean, for me, there's always the two sides that need to come together. There needs to be the positive ROI. And so it needs to make sense for the company to do it. 
but it won't be successful if the associates don't like it. Then they will find a way to get around it. It's so you need to kind of find a way to loop everybody in. And, and these are the comments that I remember when, so one quote that still it was, I believe it was a DHL picker at that time, um, that, that's branded in my mind is, uh, this is the first time order picking actually is fun. It's like, wow, okay, cool. That's, <laughs> that's what you want to hear. Uh, um, motivation is uh, it's a real it's a big deal in this industry and i think using those uh, wearables are motivating a lot of people and increasing productivity it's great perfect and now we've talked a lot about training the use of vr and training um but I, I, it doesn't need to stop there and i think scott you have some experiences with customers as well right oh, yeah absolutely you know uh, you, thinking about our audience today you know a lot of a lot of you guys are are in a logistics field or you have a logistics uh, warehousing and transportation uh, component to your business. Um, you know, we, we had an issue uh, certainly during COVID where when we built a prototype for uh, a display, right? So a physical wood metal glass display that goes into a convenience store or a drug store or a grocery store, we used to build a prototype, put it on a truck, ship it to the customer, They'd walk out and look at that and call us and say, yeah, I don't want glass on all four sides. I want a solid backing on this. And they would just tell a truck driver to bring it back, right? And so we would play this game back and forth, building these prototypes, shipping them all over the joint. And um, what we've been able to do in the last year is uh, there's a guy named Cash Walton on, uh, on, on the team with me, and he's really focused on how do we take and put the prototypes of those displays into virtual reality ship a device, right? A Quest for a Business or, 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 or Vive or, or Pico, whatever the device is, ship it out to our customers and say, hey, go in here in your office and teleport around this and take a look at this. It takes us minutes to build that prototype in VR and it takes minutes for them to give us feedback. And we just save the shipping and all the, the, the hard work and stuff there. So we're finding new ways to do design iterations with customers. How do we work with our customers on their packaging for their consumers to be able to interact with their brand through consumer AR? Um, so we're doing a lot of things that are just kind of out beyond just training in our factories, working with our customers and our OEM providers, um, truck drivers that come onto some of our, our lots, uh, interact with us through augmented reality to get uh, information on bills of lading and, and, and shipping and that sort of thing. So we're always looking for how do we expand this out? If it's good for our employees, how can we make it good for our customers and our partners as well? And so again, I'm like a broken record with this. What a great time to be in this industry, man. I mean, there's just so much opportunity. I I couldn't do it all in in a million hours a week if I wanted to. And and you already kind of made a soft transition already in our next chapter, actually, where we, we kind of went from the training aspect to the collaboration aspect of things. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit more how you really use AR, probably especially as a collaboration tool internally, maybe also externally with your customers. Yeah, I mean, we I call it factory AR, which is, you know, remote expert and guided workflows, either on a tablet, a phone. Uh, a Realware, a Hollands 2, whatever the case may be, in the hands and on the heads of our factory workers. When I give someone a device and say, you can use this device, and within a click or two, you can be talking in a live video conference with anyone in our company like that, if they're awake, right? Because you get the time zone thing. But you can be collaborating with someone. They can draw on your field of vision. They can help you fix this problem. Anyone in the company almost instantly. I mean, it's, it's huge, right? Now, all of a sudden, we don't have to wait for people to travel. We don't have to wait for um, that technician to come on site. And we can do that as well with our customers. Hey, if you're having problems with the machine uh, that you bought from us, because we build machinery also, um, you know, we've got a call center that can see through your headset, see the problem audibly and, 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 and text and visually show you how to make that, that repair. Um, and so, uh, remote collaboration, I call it remote expert, it's huge, huge for us being so dispersed. And I would imagine it is for, for some of my friends here on the call today as well. I mean, it's, it's, it's humongous. 
I totally agree. And it's, it's, it, it has become really, and that's probably the pandemic has been a driver for that, like a standard oh, yeah. tool within companies. It used to be a little bit of one-off, kind of a nice to have. Yeah, super cool, super helpful, but do we really need it? Yes, we do. <laughs> so, so that was good. And, and shifting maybe from that, um, the AR collaboration for a second over to VR collaboration, because VR can also be used in that sense. And Matt, I believe you have done some some work on that field, which is maybe a little bit more emerging. I th- yeah, Percy, I think it is. That's a great word for it, emerging. Um, when the pandemic began, one of the ideas that many of us had was, oh, let's meet in virtual reality. Let's let's dive into a virtual room and start to be productive. It was kind of like this holy grail of VR that you can create this metaverse where productivity doesn't require you to be co-located physically. Um, and I, I know that my team and, and many others have gone through iterations of, well, let's try, let's try this, let's try that, let's try alt space, let's try rec room, let's try um, spatial. And there, there's many, many others, great applications that you can, you can name off that are these meeting in virtual spaces. But one of the interesting side effects that we experienced, at least, is that um, we still wanted to have that physical experience, that whiteboard, or we wanted to have that physical room. So no one one application seemed to tick all the boxes. Um, but still, I think it's it's valuable, especially when um, there's a different way of interacting with somebody, even if it's just an avatar, because just seeing the nod of a head actually is communication. And if you're talking, yeah, <laughs> you're bobblehead. So I, I think that it was valuable. Um, I w- also would say don't forsake mini golf as a great collaboration tool as well. Because uh, if you bring a, bring a team together and you're just all doing mini golf, as, as some amazing conversations can, can occur and then bam, you've got a new product. So uh, that's that's my pitch. <laughs> I love it. Gamification. That's that's great. Um, now that we've talked a little bit about the collaboration aspects of things, let's let's maybe shift over to um, work instructions as well. Because I mean, it's it's always the I mean, you said the holy grail is is to to bring people together virtually. Um, when it comes to AR, I think the holy grail is that you don't need that other person, but that the device and the technology itself can be the helper on the job that that you you don't need to have that conversation with the expert, but the expert is your technology that helps you out. And um, I believe, Scott, that you have been very active with digital work instructions as well. So I would like to hear your thoughts on that. So I'll tell you just a a quick reason why I'm a big fan of of digital work instructions or guided workflows is I was in a factory a couple of years ago and I was talking to a factory worker and he said, uh, you know, he said he has the ability to call his boss 24 hours a day if he needs help, but he doesn't do that. And I said, well, why don't you don't why don't you why don't you call him? I mean, you know, you've got that ability. He says, well, I don't want it to be perceived that I wasn't paying attention in training. I don't want to bother him, right? And I, it's just a quick question. Um, but I'm worried at two in the morning or three in the morning um, that I'm doing something wrong. And so when we we start to put digital work instructions in place in the factories, then we see that that worker at three in the morning, if he just has a quick question, he can go reference something in digital work instructions and he doesn't have to admit that he didn't listen well in training and he doesn't have to worry about making a mistake and the machine coming down. And so digital work instructions are uh, wonderful and in, certainly in manufacturing, um, they are training and reference support materials for, for workers around the clock so that they can be more effective. I, I love that example. And it's, it's actually something that, that I would always propagate as well when we, and we kind of talk about that next, actually about the vision picking elements of, of DHL is when you compare it, for example, to voice, and it's the same thing is somebody has voice picking, somebody has spoken to you what you need to do. But unfortunately, you didn't remember all the numbers. And do you really do hit the replay button to, to listen to it again? Where while we, if you have it virt- visually, you just glance at it again, and there's no extra cost or, or, or time to do that. But you can get that right without kind of admitting to yourself that you once again forgot all, all the numbers. 
So that, that's probably the best, the, the, the perfect segue for you, Alberto, uh, as I know that DHL has been super active in, in vision picking. And if you can share a little bit about that, that would be great. Yeah, I think it's, it's important to mention that maybe one of the biggest transformations in logistics in the last year has been the warehousing uh, site itself. Because uh, we used to do a high percentage of deliveries to B2B. Um, uh, that was our business. Now, now, with this explosion of e-commerce, there is a lot of B2C. I think this vision picking is a, is a key element to be able to do this transformation. I mean, otherwise, the cost of one person running around the warehouse trying to look item by item for a, for a customer, it's, it's going to be unreasonably infinite of time, no? and, and it's not going to be at all profitable. No? Then the vision picking has allowed us to be much more productive. Uh, we increase around 15% productivity. The onboarding speed is much faster, it's around 50%. The productivity has allowed us also to reduce cost and avoid errors. No? I mean, you can imagine now that it's almost every single package is different from the other one. And the fact that you have this, this wearable and you know where you to go, tell you where to put the piece, you don't need to go and check every time the list, you know, the physical list in, in another place of the warehouse. I mean, I think without this type of uh, tools or wearables, wouldn't be have possible to go to that far in the e-commerce industry and the boom wouldn't be that big. You know? Then I think we are using it almost everywhere in the US. We're still a little bit behind in, in South America, but we already have some examples. But I think it's, a, it's necessary and it's a must to have this type of technology today in a warehouse. And, and what I find is, is always great to see also as DHL kind of started with that roughly seven years ago in 2014, that it has left that emerging state of technology and has really become a standard tool within the, the, the areas for case and each picking um, and, and has helped uh, DHL kind of to get through the peak periods because I know that some industries have been struggling and others have been under super high demand, especially as it's being used in the consumer industry for picking the consumer goods and also for uh, the, the pharma industry to distribute items that are on, on high demand these days. And, and to have a tool that allows you to immediately ramp up the workers to, to, to meet these peak periods and then get that 100% accuracy level or close to it that you need to have to fulfill the demands is, is, is just very critical. The level of, of uh, e-commerce uh, transactions have increased in the last year, like the, the period of 10 years that we expected we thought that around 30% of the transactions will be done in around 2028. And in 2021, we already had this 30%. The only way to be, to be able to adapt to this massive growth is with type, this type of tools. Otherwise, we would have need I don't know, hundreds of associates uh, employees there to, to just fulfill this demand. And that wouldn't have been possible at all, no? mm -hmm. just because of lack of of knowledge or, or even people no, around the world. But uh, yeah, we've been able to adapt and fulfill this demand, as you mentioned, in a, I would say, satisfactory way due to these uh, wearables and technology that, that allow us to be very flexible, very adaptable and very productive. Perfect, perfect. And, uh, and unfortunately, time flies. I, I see that we've used up most of our time already, or actually we're running over already a little bit. Um, but I, I still would like to give every participant uh, the opportunity to share either some thoughts on kind of what the next steps are, what you're planning to, to do, or just a little wrap up or for the audience, uh, some, some messaging that you would uh, like to, to pass on. Um, uh, who would like to start with this? As, as it, that's more ad hoc now. I'll go quick. So for us, next steps, right? We certainly want to move into some new areas and get smarter and more collaborative with XR. But I will say that I think a big thing for us, and I can't speak for, for my colleagues, but a big thing for us is I feel like we could do a better job of implementing and tracking the value of what we're doing already. Um, and so 
as much as we want to run fast or we want to do other cool things, uh, I think a big focus for us is on driving more value with the tools that we already have that are being underutilized. So that's kind of where I'm at. Perfect, perfect. And then I saw, Don, that you were ready to go as well. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you. <laughs> yeah, and I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I would just say kind of our next steps are to deploy the solution that we're offering for training out to beyond our distribution center associates, expand it out to all areas of our business. Um, but if I could just kind of close out with maybe some, some lessons learned for, for those that are joining the session, um, I'd say, you know, defining your strategy is key pre-production and post-production, you know, before you're getting ready to start the implementation, make sure you're thinking about the hardware, um, your setting, the type of VR that or solution that you want to deploy, as well as when you're post-production, um, make sure you consider, you know, how that's going to de be deployed and how associates can access the solution, whether it's through an internal kind of learning portal, um, or if they're going to what's the type of hardware gonna be? Are they gonna wear a headset or are they gonna be able to access the solution via a PC? So kind of a 2D version. Um, that was one thing that kind of definitely was a lesson learned for us through the height of the pandemic is when we started planning. Um, and so we had some concerns with sharing headsets. We've deployed this solution through 26 of our distribution centers. So we're making contact with a lot of associates. Um, and so we wanted to be able to provide a solution where if they didn't want to put on the, the headset, they didn't have to. They could use the 2D version um, as well as trainers. They could be able to look over that uh, associate's shoulder who's performing the training and kind of give them feedback when they're off track. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of my, my closing remark is a lesson learned, um, have that defined strategy before you start implementing and, and post-production as well. Perfect. And I see Alberto, you're already unmuted. So it's over to you. <laughs> Ready? No, I think, uh, we discover technology, at least I did, in, in some different dimensions, no? And some, a lot of things that we, they, they can add value to the customer that for me is the important thing. No? And uh, I think we are now in an era that it will give us a bright future. The fact, not only wearables, but Internet of Things, uh, we are really uh, concerned about uh, the Go Green program that we have. No? I think technology can also add a lot onto this to reduce the CO2 emissions. And I think all this, uh, all these new wearables, all this new technology, I think we have to embrace it. And we have to ensure that the associate creates value with this technology to the customer, to himself as well, no? and to the company. But I, I am a huge believer of that. And, and even though that I'm not running any IT department uh, specifically, but I promote technology because I think it's the future and, and, and the combination between our human side plus the technology side and the wearables, we can uh, really provide good service, safety, reduction of cost, productivity, motivation. I think there's a lot of good things that we can have through technology. You know? then thanks a lot for, for inviting me to, to this panel and I hope I gave some of the right visions and looking forward for, for more conversations of that. Absolutely, absolutely. No, it's, it's great to hear from, from the deployments in, in production. Uh, Matt, last but not least, over to you. Thank, thank you, Percy. I'll be very brief. So I guess my last uh, thoughts are when thinking about XR, uh, there's a certain amount of hype at the beginning and enthusiasm but that has to be curb, curbed by uh, having a clear understanding about what value is this tool going to provide to my organization. So I think from a developer or a, a, a center of, of discipline perspective, if we're going to use the tool, it has to clearly show value. So having some way of measuring ROI for AR or VR is critical for its success. That's, that's what I'll, I'll end with. These are great closing remarks, and I can totally agree to that. And that's that's always I I'm a computer science guy. That's what I studied at some point, and I love technology. But then I spend a long time in, in consulting, and that's where you learn it always has to serve a business purpose. So we try to combine our love to the technology with a, with a very explicit problem that we're solving and applying to that, and that's going to be great success. 
So I know that we don't have too much time left for Q&A, but let's open it up for Q&A now. Thanks a lot for participating on the panel.